Link TV presents Mosaic World News from the Middle East. Here are today's top stories. Iraq's deadliest day in two years leaves 107 dead in 13 cities. Syrian regime asserts it will not use chemical weapons under any circumstances. And police attack Moroccan citizens protesting government corruption. Mosaic World News from the Middle East begins now. The death toll of the bombings witnessed in several parts of Iraq reached 107. Most of them were civilians. In addition, over 300 people were injured. 22 attacks occurred in 14 cities. Most of the attacks targeted civilian gatherings and security checkpoints. Today was another bloody day in Iraq after over two years of calm. Hundreds were killed and wounded in a series of attacks that hit the Iraqi capital and northern cities. The 23 attacks that took place in 15 Iraqi cities were carried out with explosive belts and devices, booby-trapped cars, and a carload of gunmen. They mostly targeted the security and military centers of the police and army. These attacks are considered the bloodiest since 110 people were killed in similar attacks in May of 2010. The area of Al-Taji in northern Baghdad witnessed seven attacks, including the detonation of explosive belts and devices and a booby-trapped car, causing the deaths and injury of dozens of people. The attacks also destroyed some homes and damaged many others. Fifteen minutes before we were supposed to go up, a bomb was detonated. Where's the government? Where are the police? Where's the security and stability? And then there's all this material damage. All of these homes were damaged. Here, four homes were destroyed and about 15 homes were damaged. The city of Al Sadr, east of Baghdad, also witnessed booby-trapped car attacks that caused several deaths and injuries. The attacks caused massive damage to a number of stores and homes. We were sitting by the door and a booby-trapped car exploded. This area has families, children, young people and elders. An armed attack with automatic weapons and grenades targeted a military base in Dulaiya, north of Baghdad, leading to the deaths of several soldiers. Security sources reported two booby-trapped cars exploded near a military checkpoint in the town of Khan Banisad, northeast of Baghdad, leading to dozens of deaths and injuries. And in the northern city of Kirkuk, a number of people died and others were injured when five booby-trapped cars exploded. Diyala province, northeast of Baghdad, witnessed explosions and armed attacks on checkpoints in different areas, leaving dozens of casualties. These attacks come on the eve of statements made by the leader of the so-called Islamic State of Iraq group, in which he called on Arab gunmen to head to Iraq to participate in bloody attacks during the holy month of Ramadan. This escalation also comes amid a political crisis, as pressure is being placed on Prime Minister Minister Nouri al-Maliki by his political opponents. The Arabs have offered President Bashar al-Assad a safe exit in exchange for his quick resignation. However, Syrian Foreign Ministry spokesman Jihad al-Muqtisi confirmed that the people will decide, not the Arabs. Meanwhile, clashes are continuing in Aleppo when the army has taken control of most neighborhoods in Damascus. After fierce clashes erupted in the neighborhood of Al Mazza and Damascus between regime forces and members of the Free Syrian Army, the Maher al Assad led Force Division, supported by helicopters, was able to regain control of most neighborhoods in Damascus, according to confirmations by the official authorities. Syrian television broadcast images of the identification cards of those it referred to as terrorists, indicating that they are Jordanians and Egyptians. The Syrian Revolution's General Commission reported the resumption of violence 
violent shelling this morning in several neighborhoods in the city of Homs, as fierce clashes continue between regime forces and opposition fighters in the neighborhoods of the city of Aleppo. On the other hand, official authorities denied that clashes occurred in Aleppo, as state television broadcast video clips of the city's streets, assuring that it is calm. Meanwhile, the Syrian Foreign Ministry spokesman Jihad al-Makdisi held a press conference during which he condemned the Arab minister's call on Assad to resign and discussed the issue of biological weapons. We confirm that chemical and biological weapons will never be used. To reiterate, they will never be used during the crisis in Syria regardless of the developments on the Syrian front. The different types of weapons are stored and secured by the Syrian armed forces and are under its direct supervision and will never be used, unless Syria is subjected to a foreign aggression. At the same time, the ministry is warning of another concerning issue, and that is the possibility of terrorist groups armed from abroad amid the increasing failure to hit the political regime in Syria, arming these groups with tactical bombs or mines that contain biological substances and, God forbid, detonating them in a village, then accusing the Syrian forces of it. The change in Mr. Annan's mission is not in the hands of the Arab ministers. As for stepping down in such matters, we tell everyone, to the Arab League and to everyone, that the Syrian people make their own decisions. They are the ones who decide the fate of governments, presidents, states, etc. They are the ones who participate in a national dialogue. Arab foreign ministers had agreed during their meeting to offer Syrian President Bashar al-Assad a safe exit in exchange for relinquishing power. The Syrian opposition must now unite, internally and abroad, to form a transitional government. This does not mean that any transitional government that is formed now will remain in power forever. The Iraqi government announced that Iraq rejected the Arab League's call on Syrian President Bashar al-Assad to resign, saying that al-Assad's fate can only be decided by the Syrian people. As for Russia, Russia, President Vladimir Putin assured that toppling al-Assad may lead to a continued war and stressed that Syria's future is decided through negotiations and not on the basis of victory or loss in the conflict. And with that, the European Union decided to tighten its sanctions against Damascus and implement the weapons ban. In their meeting in Brussels, EU ministers confirmed that the ban will include the Syrian airline, which is prohibited from landing in Europe, and additional people will be added to to the list of those sanctioned. Now, Moroccans hit the streets to protest government corruption and the high cost of living. The peaceful demonstrations called by the February 20 movement were held in the city of Casablanca and the capital, Rabat. But the protests in Casablanca turned violent. Activists say police attacked protesters when they shouted slogans against the Moroccan government. Dozens of people were wounded, several arrested. The new protests come after a series of demonstrations earlier in the year. Back in January, the Moroccan government raised the price of gasoline by 20 percent, which in turn led to an increase in food prices. Elsewhere in the news now, Turkish activists are demanding the resignation of the country's interior minister over a crackdown on Kurds in the southeast. Hundreds of academics, peace activists and intellectuals accuse Idris Naim Shaheen of displaying an aggressive attitude toward Turkey's Kurdish population. They've slammed the government's response to a protest rally in the city of Diyarbakir over a week ago. Police officers attacked a pro-Kurdish rally on July the 14th, injuring and arresting dozens of people. Well, the Afghan government and the U.S. military excuse me, recently signed a deal based on which foreign forces would have to stop nighttime raids in Afghanistan. But it seems the agreement hasn't changed anything on the ground. U.S.-led nighttime raids on Afghan homes are continuing, especially in the southern parts of the country. Faiz Khorshid has more for us. Another victim of a U.S.-led nighttime raid 
Wally Khan was shot dead by U.S. forces right after they burst into his home. The U.S. military said they initially told the man killed in the raid was a militant. But after further investigation, they admitted he was not. Now all that has left to Khan's family is a picture of him. His family is now demanding justice. We not only call on our government to bring those who are responsible for his death, but we also want an immediate withdrawal of all foreign troops from our country. The raid caused a uproar in this family at that night. Most of them are still in shock. Others in this family were handcuffed and then badly tortured. These survivors of the raid also blame the American forces for stealing their $1,000 too during the raid. Yes, it's not a huge amount of money, but for a poor family like this, it is. Foreign troops not only kill innocent civilians during the nighttime raids here, but they also steal our money. That's why we call them the big criminals. Now, no one in this house likes the foreign troops. Resentment and fear is felt very much here. But it's not an isolated incident. We were shown the graves of many other local villagers near where Wali Khan was laid to rest, who were also killed in such nighttime raids. We are being threatened both by militants and foreign troops. There is a large number of Afghan and foreign forces here. But bombers can make their way easily inside. However, this one came in a very sensitive time. It has also greatly angered the Afghan government because U.S. forces are not allowed anymore to enter and search Afghans' homes. This has been recently agreed both by Washington and Kabul. Afghans here are saying it wouldn't be tolerated anymore that foreign troops enter into their homes at night time. Such calls have been repeatedly made by President Hamid Karzai, but it seems U.S. forces are not willing to stop their raids. They describe them as the major part of their mission in this country. Fires for Sheet Press TV, Helmand. In a televised speech on the 60th anniversary of the July 23rd revolution, Egyptian President Mohamed Morsi said that the revolution enabled the Egyptian people to start determining their fate. But at the same time, the president added that the revolution failed to accomplish some of its goals, especially those associated with civil liberties. This is the first time a president with an Islamic political background participates in the events commemorating the July revolution, since that era witnessed clashes between Islamic and national forces. The 1950s and the 1960s, and you remember the 1960s, and you know what the 60s were like. This is how the new president referred to the era of Gomel Abdel Nasser and the July Revolution during his inauguration speech. That era witnessed clashes between the Islamic movement and nationalist forces. On that day, the president was in Tahrir Square, speaking to the revolutionaries about the revolution's cost. But today the president is in the presidential palace, and he must speak to all Egyptians about the July Revolution. It was a glorious revolution in Egypt as a state and for Egyptians as a people. People. But it does not hold the same status for the Islamist forces. So here's the issue. What does an Islamist president say on a nationalist holiday to a street that celebrates annually a revolution that changed the face of Egypt? The January Revolution of 2011 is certainly an extension of the Egyptian people's history of struggle, starting from the time of popular uprisings at the end of the 18th century. The speech discussed half-complete past glories that could lead to a bright future. This is how the president avoided shocking the nationalist street and distorting the Islamist street's recollection of the events. In the past and during the former president's era, the July Revolution was completely glorified and had no flaws. Some claim that this is because of the former president's affiliation to the revolution's era and the military. 
But there are some people who glorify the revolution without glorifying the military. They distinguish between the military of that time and today's military. In both cases, the Islamists have no claim to the July revolution. We must say that the July revolution is glorious, whether we want to or not, because this is a duty for us and the president. July is a national holiday, and its vision must be clear. It is too early to speak of reconciliation between the Islamist forces and the July Revolution's forces. But there is no doubt that as political Islam has gained power, priorities will be reassigned and maybe history will be reinterpreted, if not rewritten. It is a precedent in Egypt for an Islamist president to mark the anniversary of a nationalist president who clashed with the Islamists. A precedent that may indicate that what the first revolution missed, the second revolution is attempting to continue. قالت مؤسسة أنقذ الأطفال العالمية إن ربع أطفال العالم لا يحصلون على الغذاء. The international organization Save the Children said a quarter of the world's children do not receive the nutrition required for normal growth, as 300 children die every hour due to malnutrition. A report by the organization revealed that malnutrition stunted growth for over half of the world's children, and that 170 million children under the age of five have stopped properly growing due to food shortages. The report ranked Japan as the best place to be. A child, while Somalia was considered the worst, and a significant decline in children's living conditions was noticeable in the Palestinian territories. Shukhti al Kashif reports from Gaza. We are in the area of Al Manalha near the Al Zaytun neighborhood in southern Gaza City. Over 200 families live here. Children, people, and cattle live in the same place, in houses under construction. We will try to look into their situation and visit some of the houses to see how people live here. The condition of Radwan al-Malahi's home is almost unbearable, as insects and flies have almost become part of his home that barely fits him, his six children, and their mother. There are only two rooms with asbestos roofs that obviously cannot shelter them from the winter's cold or the summer's heat. It would be enough for me if my kids get an education and study and succeed. What can I tell you? I want them to have a good future. That's the most important thing for me. I don't care about anything else. I worry about them. Of course I worry about them. I'm deadly afraid for them. Your child is your life. Of course, you're going to worry. Children here only eat one meal a day that consists of some vegetables. They rarely change their clothes and frequently complain about diseases caused by poverty and poor hygiene. However, child Malik seems to suffer even more as her face is disfigured and she endures pain in her eye. Her mother complains about the international and local organizations' lack of interest in helping them. How can I get her treatment. Do you see the situation here? How can I? From where? If I go see a doctor, they ask for money, and I say I don't have any. Will they believe me? No, they won't. We have no food, no clothes, and no money. We didn't get any help for Ramadan. The international organization has indicated that institutions and governments have neglected to care for the children, seeing that the rates of poverty and unemployment and the political situation in the Palestinian territories have negatively impacted the lives of Palestinian children. More than 68 percent of the children are anemic. In general, this is an indicator that the children's situation in the Gaza Strip is getting worse and worse as long as the Israeli authorities are imposing a siege on the Gaza Strip. Their conditions cannot even be wished for an enemy. In small rooms, inside houses under construction, a large number of them live in an area that lacks an infrastructure and essential services. International organizations believe the poverty, hunger and unemployment will not end unless Israel lifts its ongoing siege on the Gaza Strip. Shifti al Kashif, BBC, the Gaza Strip. قطاع غزة
open with local politics and the storm raging within the Kadima party. Kadima Chairman Shao Mofaz has asked the Knesset's House Committee to approve a request to oust four Kadima Knesset members from the party after they tried to join the coalition. Here with more on the ever-changing Israeli political map is IBA's Eli Wogelander. Good evening, Eli. Good evening. Thank you, Yochanan. As many had predicted, the decision by Kadima Chairman Shaul Mofaz to leave the coalition has resulted in a fracture of the party. Mofaz is the one doing the house cleaning and had harsh words of criticism today for the Kadima party MKs who have been negotiating with Likud. After submitting a request to the Knesset House Committee to oust four Kadima members from the party, Mufaz held a news conference at the Knesset and said, whoever wants to go, should go. If you want to join the corrupt and the draft dodgers, there is no place for you in Kadima. Anyone who wants to take political bribes can go, and we won't let Netanyahu pass a second ta law using political bribery. Anyone who negotiated with Netanyahu will have to do some soul searching with themselves, their family, and their children. Ironically, of course, Mufaz himself negotiated with Netanyahu and brought Kadima into the coalition a little over two months ago. Today's move by Mufaz follows late night meetings last night as Kadima rebels, headed by former minister Tzachi Negbi, attempted to recruit seven Kadima MKs to leave the party for Likud. Another man today tried to commit self immolation in order to bring attention to his dire financial difficulties. Authorities said the man was from o Ofakim and tried to set himself ablaze near the town's local police station. Police arrived quickly on the scene and extinguished the flames before the man suffered major injuries. Meanwhile, a 45-year-old disabled IDF veteran, Akiva Mafi, remains in critical condition. Mafi torched himself yesterday in the town of Yehud. He is still in hospital with burns over 80% of his body. Doctors in Tel Shomer Medical Center described his chances of survival as slim. The IDF, Disabled Veterans Organization, said that further acts of self-immolation are possible, and they lashed out at what they described as neglect toward the veterans. Mafi was heavily in debt, and his request for financial aid, and in the past, the Defense Ministry's Rehabilitation Division has rejected his pleas. The views expressed on Mosaic are from contributing broadcasters, not Link TV or its sponsors. The production of Mosaic is made possible by grants from the John D. and Catherine T. MacArthur Foundation, the Wincote Foundation, the Firedall Foundation, and by support of viewers like you. Thank you. Watch Mosaic World News online. Stay up to date with breaking news, read our blog, get transcripts of past shows and more at linktv.org slash mosaic. channel of uncompromising stories, world news, documentaries, entertainment, and culture. Link TV, connecting you to the world. For more information, visit linktv.org.